Yep, so as everyone knows, this is gonna be an information session um, about CTF tools, hopefully to help you guys with, uh, oops, with the in-class CTF on Tuesday. Um, we haven't seen the challenges, but judging by what we know about Professor Dupe, probably can kind of guess what some of the tools you guys will need for this. All right, so you guys know I'm Gabe and then there's Proof. And yeah, I'm Poor. I'm going to be answering all your questions in the chat. And I'll try my best to keep up with the chat as well. All right, so slide. So overview, um, we're going to go over like just some quick setting up your Linux virtual machine. Uh, just from the, some of the questions I got from the in-class CTF last Tuesday. And then we're going to go over Netcat, Pwn Tools, S-Trace, L-Trace, Kidra, and ROP. <clears throat> Okay, so um, I recommend that you get a full-blown Linux machine. So, like, either use VirtualBox or VMware. If you, um, I usually I just got a license key off eBay for VMware. I think it just runs smoother, but you don't really need it. And and also another tip is make sure you guys stay organized. Like, there's gonna be plenty of challenges, so it's imperative you stay organized. So the way I always organize it is I always have like I just make a folder called CTFs, and then I just name a directory for each challenge and then put in like my notes the flag itself and then whatever like down like binaries and stuff that's downloaded from it okay so you will need linux uh this is an issue that came up from some students uh from the last ctf so like if you try running it through the ubuntu subsystem it's not going to work and if you try running on mac os it's not going to work the reason why is because we're using 32-bit binaries and it's compiled on Ubuntu so you're gonna need that operating system to actually execute those executables uh, I think the reason why the Windows Ubuntu subsystem doesn't work quite work very well is because it's not like a full-blown uh, Linux machine but I'm not 100% sure it's just not gonna work though as you can tell by these screenshots so then there's my setup uh, I just set up a virtual box and SSH into it you guys can just read the slides and send me emails or questions if you have more questions on the way I have things set up. And I, I use the Ubuntu server version just because most of the things you're going to do is command line and it stays on battery life. It stays on your hard drive memory. Like I don't I have a potato for a computer, so I don't have a hard drive memory to spare. <laughs> okay, so the first tool we're going to be going over is Netcat. So basically, Netcat is for reading and writing to some sort of network communication. You're probably going to able to use this because the the challenge are probably gonna get harder so like other CTS will have like netcat challenges so so I will just show a simple example so this is from Pico 2019 CTF and basically it just says to use netcat to connect to this host at this port so this is a really simple challenge we'll make this bigger so So we'll just do, oh, I got to the chat, there you go. So we'll just do NC for netcat, 219.shell, 1.picoctf.com, and then the port is 47229. And we just run that. And this, as you can tell, this is also on my uh, Linux virtual machine. Okay, so normally this would work uh, because the problem is uh, the challenge changes uh, the ports around and stuff for the different users, but that's basically where you gonna enter in your command line. And <laughs> if you do it correctly, you'll get this output. <laughs> so uh, I highly recommend doing um, Pico CTF uh, 2019, the general skill challenges for other uh, challenges to help you on the in-class CTF coming up Thursday. <laughs> so yeah, so go live demos. They don't normally work out. So yeah. So you want to follow along, uh, go on the Piazza post and there's a, yeah, sorry. Uh, go on the Piazza post and uh, go, there's a download link with all, like a lot of the stuff we have on the slides. All right, so as Professor Dupe went in class, like the big, we got the big tool that he uh, went over is Pwn Tools. So the reason why we're going over this is because, so basically Pwn Tools is a Python library. Um, uh, toolbox that optimizes CTFs. Here's a link to download it. Um, it automates challenges. 
uh, which you'll see in an example coming up. And the reason why we're teaching this to you is because you guys might have like some crazy, ridiculous challenges that you don't want to do by hand. And it's not, it's like some of it's pretty tedious. So, or like when an interactive shell isn't available. So like your assignment six, all the challenges you can complete on, you know, when you SSH into the server, but the upcoming in-class CTF might not let you do that. And that's why we're teaching you Netcat phone tools. So uh, let's just go real fast and so that you don't have to read through the crazy amount of documentation on it. So these are the functions you're really going to be using and care about. It's going to be process, remote, receive, until, send, line, and interactive. So, or in at, yeah. So like basically uh, when we go through the example, this will make more sense. But uh, yeah, so everything's like on the side of what you need. So those are the big ones that you're going to worry about. So the first example is going to be uh, land of sums. It was called originally called dank examples. This is from uh, Mahalas from the Pwn Devils. So, let me do that. so we're going to just run land of sums. Oh, and so another reason why Pwn tools is also pretty useful is because sometimes you might not get source code. So like some challenges you get the source code for it. And in others you might not. And so like, for instance, the land, like the land of sums, example that we're going over that I posted on the Gauza post as well. There's no source code for it. So you guys aren't going to be able to read it. So instead we're just going to you know, run it and see what happens. So it looks like the pretty simple, easy one. So add these two. So let's uh, nine plus 25. So 94. And that's it. Okay. We won. Awesome. Pretty easy, right? Well, the problem is what happens if this challenge says, it does this like a hundred times with random integers. Like, are you guys gonna spend a whole hour of class like hand jamming, adding every single integer like together? I really hope not. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so like we're gonna need to find a way to like make it automate this. So I already gave you guys the solutions to this just so that, that way you get an idea of how to use Poem Tools. So, oops. There he goes. Okay, cool. So we're just gonna go over real fast what this code does. Uh, I was gonna do a live demo, but I really don't feel like typing and explaining everything. So the first thing, so like we go back to these slides. The first one is process, right? So the first, so for this example, we're targeting a binary on our local machine, but later on, you guys might have to target on the server. So that's what remote is for. So for this example, we're using process because we have the binaries on our machine, but like for other challenges, you're gonna probably gonna use remote with, and then there'll be like a given a URL or and then a port number. And there's another example in the slides later on that will show this. So we're, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get standard out. So like you're gonna do, so this print statement is just, here, we'll do this. So the first thing is this process. So um, like it just targets the local process, but you're most likely gonna be using remote for the, like the other challenges when it ha you have to do it on a remote server. Uh, and then we're just gonna do receive until because in our example, it's we just, so we need to get the program to read in um, until a certain point. So we're just gonna read up until this please add because that's all there is. And then next, we're gonna re re receive until, and then it accepts a byte amount. So like for this case, we just use 1024, and then we're gonna decode it into ASCII. And then we're gonna parse the two integers. So like, that's, where, that's why we're calling these nums, because that's where we're getting the two integers, uh, 69 and 25. And then basically here, we're gonna actually do the arithmetic and then print out the sum. And then finally, we're gonna do send line to send it back to the program itself. And then we just re receive everything else afterwards. And that's basically how you, how it gets it ran down. Does anyone have any questions or getting confused about that? But yeah, so it'll just look like this. So I'm, this probably won't be able to run just cause I updated my server, but yeah. So like you're gonna run rock, paper, scissors. It's gonna say this. It's gonna ask what my hacker name is. I just typed in Mr. Robot. And then, so I guess this challenge, it says what the robot thinks you're gonna choose. So in order to beat it, it thinks you're gonna choose paper. So it's probably gonna choose scissors because it thinks you're gonna choose paper. So therefore you should choose rock. So hence, that's why I chose rock. And then we win and then we keep going. And then, so like, if you see up here it says win a hundred games, 
like if you get a challenge like this in class i really hope you and your teammates aren't playing this a hundred times especially like it's just gonna get a little ridiculous so like towards the end um like here if you choo choose another if you like so like if you just choose something that's wrong you'll just crash the program you just start a hundred times again so this is why Pwn Tools is so useful is to automate this. And sorry, I'm not providing solutions for it. This is something for you to try at home. I think there's a pretty cool challenge too. Um, it, it also like just mentally prepares you like, you know, not all challenges are like some crazy binary reversing stuff. So. All right, and then finally for our third one, you could play this on opponable.kr. It's a simple buffer overflow. Professor Dupay actually made a video on it, how he saw beat it, but this just gets back to the whole, like you might not be able to get the binary. You might not be able to download the binary to your local machine and exploit to get the flag. Similar to like, you know, your assignment six where you could just run basic overflow and then run your payload and get the flag. This you might have to like, use some sort of automated tool like Pwn Tools to send your payload to the specific server at a specific port. So um, I challenge you to do this on your own as well before you look at the solution. And then Professor Dupay has like a good 10 minute view of how he goes over it. So it's just like Bandit, if you guys cheat, I don't know, like you won't learn anything, but yeah. All right, so finally, we're going to now reverse challenges tools. So like, so that's the RE in the challenges from last Tuesday, if you remember. Um, so this is specifically challenging because this is when you don't get the source code. You just get the binary. And, you know, there's no, like, .c file for you to look at. So these are some tools I always usually run on, like, reversing challenges. So, like, the first five on the left is, like, what I normally run for enumeration, which just means, like, my little process. So the first thing I always run is just file because file will tell you what kind of file it is. It'll tell you like what kind of executable it is. So like if it's a Linux-based executable or 32-bit or C4-bit. And for this class, I'm 90% sure we're only sticking with 32-bit. So you don't have to worry about any um, higher, crazier ones. And then next is just run strings. Like your like you know like your print statements will have strings and hope and that will just you know find the strings in the file. Then you got ltrace and schtrace, which we'll go over soon. GDB, which I did a recession about, I think, two weeks ago now on it. And then Gidra, which we'll go over in this information session. And then there's also Object Dump, Read Elf, and Binwalk. You guys could look those up and try them up yourself. But these are really good tools for risking challenges. It just helps you, like, gauge what kind of file there are and, like, how you can try to read into it. So this is just what S-Trace will look, look like. So this A.out is just a simple Hello World application. I'm just showing you like what your output is. So sys, sys, S trace, it stands for system trace and it will trace all the system calls and signals. So like you see all this garbo that I, I, I will not admit I know what's going on, but it just goes back to like how when programs execute, it's doing a lot more in the background than you think. And then this is L traces library trace, which I find myself using more just cause you could see like, it just checks, traces the library. And so like this simple program is just a hello world app and there it is. So like the print print f function it's a library function right it's just standard input output and it, it just shows you like oh there like it this got called so that's those are some useful tools uh i would refer back to this slide and you know try these different tools to like look at your reversing challenges come thursday or tuesday tuesday right yeah <laughs> all right so now we're gonna go over gidra uh whoa. Oh, okay, cool. There it goes. Okay, so it is a reverse engineering tool by the NSA. Supports x86 assembly. Perfect, because that's what we're do working on. Um, uh, it's free. Um, it's written in Java, so it's cross-compatible. And then, so when you download it, it's going to be saved like this. So you just double-click it, opens, or you could just do dot slash on, like, Linux machines. Uh, for Mac users, you're going to get this warning. So you got to go to security preferences and click open anyways. Uh, all right, cool. So um, this is just going to be a fast, oh, like, uh, like the same Hello World application that we had earlier. So yeah, so this one's super simple, just to get you to see, even see what the program does. Idra, so don't, just double click on the executable. It's written in Java, so it's cross compatible, cross platform. So just let it load up. 
So we're just going to do new project because that's what's going to be, uh, we'll just call it temp2 or temp1 or 2 for now, finish. And then you're going to click the little dragon icon to open it up. So all you got to do is just do file import file. And I just did that. And so for this one, it's just a dot out. That's just hello world. So you click select to import. It's going to like kind of, it kind of has its own, like, you know, it'll run file on it and it'll see that it's a uh, executable on x86 Linux. So, okay. And then it's going to say it has been analyzed yet. So you want to analyze it, click yes. And then I always check box the decompiler parameter ID and you'll see, and it just helps with like, um, the naming of variables and you'll see why in a minute. So cool. Uh, like, yeah, so it looks like really crazy, really intimidating, right? So, oh, and then you finally scroll down, it says like function and you could finally see some stuff that like we've kind of reviewed in class. So like you got like your sub RSP, so um, stack pointer and then some stuff. So this is the, how you could like read the assembly. You could also use object dump. But for the, this case, just so we could speed it up along, we're just gonna go to the symbol tree and we're gonna go to filter. So like most programs, you don't wanna say all of them, but most programs have a main function, right? So we're just gonna search up main. And of course we got a main function. So hop on that and it'll jump to where the main function is located. And then on the right here, you can see there's a, it, it decompile, has a decompiler for you. That's freaking awesome. Like, there you go. So like, we could see that this program is main and then takes in nothing and it calls print F and returns zero. And as, I, as you can see, you could like click around your decompiler and see like in the assembly uh, where it's at. Um, I would not take this as gospel. Like Gidra is not perfect. It's doing its best, but for like these simple applications and hopefully these CTF problems, it this should be plenty for you guys. Like. Like, uh, like you don't have to, you, you should learn how the basics of how to read x86 for this class, but as you can see, like Ghidra and these types of tools kind of helps with that. So like, that's, uh, the super easy example for the hello world. And then all these are on the slides as well. So you don't have to just watch my recording. So like that's opening a project, importing the file, make sure you, I always like to do the decompile parameter ID. You don't have to. And then, so like, yeah, every program has a main. So we're gonna, you know, like search for main and then we'll start from there. And then like, uh, and then from there you could jump to different functions. So now I'm gonna pass it off along to, for this example. And um, this is from a crack me. And there's also a YouTube channel that kind of explains how to go on with this. So I'm gonna stop sharing. All right, so I'm gonna show you guys how to like break um, one small challenge on Ghidra. Um, so I'm going to open up Ghidra. Let's... So like I said, in Linux, you like, you have to do the dot slash for the executable to run it in windows and Mac. I'm pretty sure you can just double click and I'll open it for you. Right, so I think that it's this challenge over here. Yep, that's correct. Right, so it asked me if I want to analyze it. I'll hit yes, and then I'll click this one. And then you don't have to, but I'm going to um, check this and then hit analyze. All right, so I think it has analyzed the binary. Now, the first thing we want to do is search for the main function because most binaries have a main function. That's the entry point to the program. All right, so once we click on that, um, we're going to get something like this. So this is the disassemble code of the binary, and this is the decompiled version of it. Um, so the first thing what I use uh, usually do is I change uh, the default uh, signature of the main function because as we all know, most of the programs, they start with this. Let's see.
So as soon as I hit OK, it's going to change a lot of variables as you'll see in there. All right. So as you saw that it changed a lot of things in there. Um, I'll show you um, again. So if I do undo. Yeah. Okay. Anyways. So the first thing you notice is uh, there's a variable that's being initialized and then there's a if uh, uh, condition. Um, so if you read the if condition, it says arg c equals to two. So what does that mean? It means uh, two arguments are supposed to be provided in order to enter this uh, if condition or else it's just going to exit the program. So uh, first condition is always the name of the binary and then the second condition is what you enter is in as an argument. Um, so the first variable, um, it says string length argv. So this is the length of the string that the user inputs when um, it he runs, he or she runs it in the terminal. So I'm just gonna rename this to make it even more clear to uh, arg, um, arg one length. And as you'll see, it changed the variable names and all the different instances it occurred. So the next thing we are gonna see is, um, so our, our goal is to print the flag, right? So we're just gonna go start from the beginning and then try to um, go into the condition where it prints a flag. So the next thing we see is if the length of the input is 10. So we know that the length of the input is supposed to be 10 in order to get the flag. And then the next thing is if argv14. So this means the first argument uh, the the second argument, so the first index, this fourth uh, fourth index is supposed to be an at in order to um, reach this condition. So let's try running the binary um, by fulfilling all the conditions given in there. Oh, there you go. Rev. So as you see, if we don't enter anything, it will go through. It wouldn't work. So what we need to do is fulfill all the conditions in there. So we need to do our rev and then the length is supposed to be 10. So we could enter anything like A, B, C, D, but we need to make sure the fifth character is an add. So I'm gonna enter that. I want to go five, six, seven. And there you go, there's our flag. So that's how you uh, reverse engineer a binary and get the flag. Um, so I think uh, Gabe, Gabe will show you the next uh, binary that I created. All right, so yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's a pretty simple one. So once again, uh, everything's in the slides. So just recap, he's just renaming stuff. Um, you can also double click the function and see what it does. And you can just see it's just, um, just a message that's like, hey, you, it failed. So, and then you can also click back to like, go back to the function. And then basically you're gonna read some code because uh, yay reading, that's, that's what we do in this class, right? We just read code and how to hack and break it. So, um, yep, so this is my payload, I just use A's. And it's a prove actually created this awesome take home challenge for you guys to try out. Uh, it's called crack this 32. Uh, I think I'm guessing 32 stands for 32 bit. It's in the same folder and I'll challenge you guys to use Gidra and do a similar approach and try to find the flag yourself. Um, we're not. Yeah, if you yeah, if you guys need help uh, with the solution, just hit me up on Discord. Uh, it's Trisho. It's given there. Yep. All right. Yeah, uh, and then we'll also be staying after the recess for half an hour and just for you guys to hit up questions and stuff. I know there's a lot, so. All right. So I know this is a really complicated topic. So we're gonna. I'm gonna go over ROP. So let's do it. So first off, we gotta understand buffer overflow. Like you have to understand buffer overflow before you can understand ROP, unfortunately. So the first, the thing with buffer overflows is, is like this vulnerability has been out since like C 
came out, right? So we have created mechanisms in place to prevent people from overflowing with the buffer and doing stuff they're not supposed to. So the, some of the things that we made was NX, which is no execute, and DEP, or data prevention, data execution prevention. So basically, like when you fill up your buffer with A's and try to run some sort of shell code, like your own code, which we're talking about shell code, it's your own, right? It's, it just says, oh, hey, why, why is this program trying to execute another program from the stack? I don't, and it just kills a program. So that's what NX and DEP does. And then there's ASLR, where we talked about this in class, where basically this, the memory keeps moving every time you run the program just to prevent you from like ever you know, finding where your buffer is and then writing a bunch of A's into it and then hopefully overflowing the buffer. So the problem with that is like, you have to keep the program to keep, to keep running, you have to keep running the program to brute force this, right? So instead of the stack, what ROP does is we're gonna target the registers. And I think that's like really cool. So the idea, big idea of ROP is you're chaining a bunch of gadgets to execute code. So the big thing with this to understand it's it's a code reuse attack. Like you are limited to the instructions in the binary. Like you cannot input your own shell code to this. That's the difference between a ROP and a buffer overflow. So like remember shell code is like your own code, like code that you're trying to inject into the program to make it do stuff. With ROP, you're limited to only the instructions in the binary. So like that's why it's a it's really important you understand that too. So if you remember from your 230 class, which I don't think many of you guys do, pop places the top of the stack to a designated register. So like when you pop EBP, the base pointer, it'll pop it off the, um, the top of the stack into the register EBP. So like that's just uh, you know recall from 230. I know most of you guys probably don't remember this. You're like, registers? We got to deal with those again? Yeah. For, for ROP, you do. So uh, think of gadgets as instruction groups that end with return. So like, if you remember in like assembly, you have like return instructions. So that's what um, we're gonna be like exploiting. So like, hence that's where the return part in return oriented programming is. So we're, we're gonna be like utilizing those return instructions. And then we get the arguments from pop. So like up here, like as you pop stuff off the stack, it gets saved into the registers. So that's um, where gadgets are essentially doing. Um, and then you're going to try to organize those registers in a way that allows you to execute some sort of code that you're trying to run. So here's an example is like, so like when the program calls a leave, so like we start like this return address one. So like move, so like your prologue, like move this, the base pointer into the stack pointer and then pop the base pointer off. So now EBP gets saved into a register. And then, it, so like, we can manipulate that and then into our gadget, which is like these instruction sequences. And then you could do, continue to do it again and again. And then, so you have like the, a bunch of nth instructions executed and a bunch of returns that return to the stack and then to your gadget and then to the stack and back. So that's what this image is basically saying is, and that's what, what ROP is, is you're using those return, <laughs> return calls to uh, exploit some sort of program. So this one is a lot, this one, like hopefully this part will make more sense. So like this website has the Linux syscall references. Um, so like sysxq, uh, you could see like ebx, ecx, edx, those are registers, right? So what essentially you're doing with ROP is you're using those gadgets to get these like registers ready in, in a certain way. So that way, <laughs> you can call um, this library function. And you gotta remember, like, that's why I stress that it's, these are a code reuse attack. Like, you're not injecting your own shell code to this. You're literally like using those, like you're using those um, leave from the stack and getting these registers set up in a way that you could call these uh, sys, like these different sys calls. So we're just using this one as an example, as an example, but you know, this in sys, like, this syscall might not be the exact one. So like this website is really useful. So like you hop, if we hop onto it, like you, there's like all these different library functions and stuff that you can like these syscalls that you can utilize and exploit. So uh, let's see. So yeah, like you're, so like if you wanna, 
So like, as you can see, like these registers have to be set up in a certain way and then like your register labeled here. And then, so this one is specifically for 32 bit. If you're dealing with 64 bit, it's going to be a whole new ball game, but that's the big idea of ROP. Does anyone have any questions? I know like, uh, I didn't understand at first. I know a lot of students like probably did not understand when professor Dupay was going over in class. So that's why I wanted to like, uh, give you the guys the big picture of Rob. No one? Okay, so let's see if I have. Ah, yes, yeah, so here's my exa here's an example of what a exploit will look like. So, like, as you can see, like, um, there's, uh, there's different tools and stuff that will help you create these. So, so, like, you can see here that you're popping EVX doing return and then injecting something, and then you're popping EX. EBX doing return and putting this in and as you can see like as you read through these comments and stuff you could like see like those different returns and that's what you're basically using in um, in ROP so so some ROP tips so refer back to Professor DuPay's lecture and hopefully my explanation kind of helps now understand the big picture and hopefully you can now understand what Professor DuPay is explaining if you don't, we'll be here for you know office hours after this. Um, understand what instruction you're trying to exploit. So like remember, like you you can only exploit whatever uh, instructions are in the binary. So like, and then there's also like this chart that tells you like the different syscalls you can use. Um, you still need to control EIP. Like that's why we teach buffer overflow first because you need to be able to control the stack to the point where you could make it jump around and do other stuff. And the reason why you're, this is different than buffer overflow is because you're not injecting your own shell code onto the stack. You're using like the code, like the binary's own libraries against it. And I think, I, don't know, I think that's like one of the coolest thing and it's really trippy, but yeah. And then, so I would research um, automated tools like ROP and ROPPER and hopefully good luck on assignment six. Cause that's unfortunately, that's actually a really simple ROP challenge. Uh, so yeah, and then if you think this stuff was cool, check out Home Devils, and then there's like this awesome meme of like what you guys would be like on Tuesday, like <laughs> uh, especially now that you guys are using that as your final. And then anyone have any questions?